To start with, how do we keep things in proportion when it comes to dealing with life's problems? Life has such a limited number of moments in it. I, I have felt that for a long mm -hmm. time, that the time goes by and you can't recapture it. And people, I think, in their relationships in life, especially their marriage relationships, their relationships with their children, are so apt to think that time is frozen that situations are frozen, that the kind of difficulty that they are in at the moment is a frozen thing that it's not going to change. And the moment is so soon passed. It's quite the other way around. Whether you're having a, a titanic fight or whether you're having uh, a, a beautiful moment together, the time isn't going to last long. Why are there some Christians who seem to always be making claims about healing and perfection in this life and so forth when we live in a fallen world and Christians and non-Christian alike being in a fallen world have to face these things? I think it's a misunderstanding of, um, of the promises that God has given which do uh, apply to the future. I think we are going to have perfection and we're going to have perfect bodies and we're going to have no sorrow and there'll be no tears and that kind of thing. And I think people have an expectation of an immediate freedom from pain and from uh, any kind of suffering. So it's as if the moment you became a Christian, you stepped into peace, affluence, and perfect health. Uh, and I don't find any promises in the Bible there, nor stories concerning, uh, if I could put it this way, uh, the favorite characters of the Bible. You, you, you take Paul and uh, Timothy and Stephen and so on in the New Testament, or Daniel in the Old Testament, and you find that the that the stories which give us such courage to go on are stories concerning uh, a combination of their faithfulness and their trust in the midst of difficulties. So you see Daniel in the lion's den, as, as I pictured as a very young child. Um, Have people spiritualized these things so the impact of the fact they had it, real problems is somehow softened into this is religious or something? It seems it, it, it must be that, that, uh, that there's a kind of a putting off of that out of, of the reality of day-by-day -day life. And they don't feel the, the mud as well as the blood, sweat, and tears, but the mud and the discomfort, the cold, the hunger, the ugliness of surroundings that Jeremiah had in, in his pit. Uh, and they sing, Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see, which comes from Jeremiah in Lamentations. I mean, this is Jeremiah's actual um, praise to God. I mean, it's, it's his verbalization, it's his phraseology as he thanks God. But in the midst of the, of the pit, he's right there in the pit when he's saying it. Where, where have and you... they take him out of the pit and, in, in their imaginations. They, I include myself in that. I've often sung that song especially before I wrote the book of fiction, thinking of, of flowers on the breakfast table and orange juice and steaming coffee and croissants and so on, this kind of morning by morning new mercies I see in the midst of something very lovely in the morning. Um, and not at all with Jeremiah. There he was in the pit, uh, having through his memory remembered things that God had done for him and remembered things God had done for other people before him, which is what we're supposed to be doing. If we wake in prison, if our life takes us into concentration camp or some dreadful uh, combination of things such as is going on in starving Africa today, uh, if we are in the midst of that, um, that praising of God can belong to us. How have you seen this idea of suffering come together. And just take that cancer as an actual example rather than getting into the theory. How have you dealt with this, Mother? 
Right, I'll, I'll deal with that. I'll say that, that one of my greatest preparations for dad's cancer was your polio. I mean, I, that, that was the most difficult. You, you have a, well, Francis is older now, but you have had a two-year-old boy uh, as an only son at that time. Um, that, that was, before dad's cancer, one of the worst periods of my life in uh, the rapidity with which that change came and people who go through that kind of difficulty with their children or with another member of the family will know what I'm talking about. It's the rapidity from perfect health, perfect balance to suddenly seeing uh, a disease take hold. And I'll speak of dad's cancer in a moment. I mean, we all lived through that during the filming time and we weren't quite aware of it. Uh, when your polio hit you, um, it was a matter of hours that uh, that the, you, you could almost see as if it were one of these films that film uh, a plant growing, put it together rapidly. You know, you could see the deflating of the muscles in your in your leg, and it, it just seemed unbelievable. But I would say that my occupation with you at that time, and then I'll come to Dad a bit later, my occupation with you at that time in the hotel in Paris, on the train as we came back, and in the proceed. The, the months that followed. Um, it was a moment by moment, day by day, consideration of the importance of that moment in your life, as well as in mine, as well as before God and the angels and the, the thing of, of prayer and so on. It's a combination of the whole thing. It's, it, it relates back to that treating each moment as important, because it was important at that time in, in, in Paris not to sit down and wail that, oh, Frank, you may have cancer, this looks like, I mean, polio, um, polio. this looks like, I, I don't know of any other disease that would behave like this except polio. Here was a little two-year-old that needed to be occupied with, with, I mean, that, you could sit on the bed, you could play, you had wailed, I can't walk, and I had said, well, we'll find out about that later now, let's have this game, and we played, and so in a sense, that's the way it is all through life. You may say, well, that's different than an older, you know, your husband suddenly having cancer. I would go back to the, to our time of filming, uh, the preceding, well, preceding, during the beginning of the cancer, uh, Dad's tiredness in Israel, in, in, in that filming when he must have been doing it with cancer, it was day by day um, encouraging him, trying to do the, 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 the physical things that would help, whether it was orange juice or whatever, but, but uh, encouraging him in, in praying with him as he himself prayed day by day, Lord, you know, I can't do it today, but do it, you know, show your strength in my weakness today. The evidence of the reality of answered prayer is seen on that film in the fifth episode. It's right there for yourself, for us as a family, for anybody else to see that day by day in the face of impossibility, that's, an that's important episode. thing was just, done. Let me just clarify, because we didn't... That's episode five of Whatever Happened to the Of Whatever race. Happened to the Human Race. That's yeah. episode five. Now, had Dad given up, because he's the one that could have given up and said, I can't go on, I really can't go on, I'm too, uh, there's something wrong with me. Had I, as a wife, given up and, 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 and been struck with, uh, with terror and said, now, you've just got to get out of here, we've got to go see a doctor or something, there must be something wrong with you. There would be no episode five, which just, I'm trying to put things into a framework of, of, uh, of all of life and then of eternity as a huge circle around it. Um, here you have, um, here you have a, a, a day, a few weeks, incredibly important if that episode is important in making vivid to people the substitutionary death of Christ in, in, in the context of Abraham and so on, uh, the, the wonder of the resurrection in the context of the garden tomb and, and, and all that took place there. That could have been wiped out. To me, that's a tremendously um, vivid illustration of what you're asking. Let me ask How do you treat suffering? You realize that there is something, whether for the hour or the day or the moment, the, could have more importance. People may say, oh, well, we aren't making a film, so how, I mean, our lives aren't going to be multiplied on Tuesday the 5th of October. It's not going to be multiplied. That isn't the point. The, when, when you see in the, in the um, framework of eternity, of God saying that uh, 
we, we have no idea of the importance. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a battle going on in the heavenlies. Mm -hmm. there, is, uh, uh, there is more taking place every moment of every person's life than they can possibly evaluate or, or, or um, uh, analyze. Now, seeing life in that context of the, the, there is something important today, and, and the prayer morning by morning should be, and I'm not just saying, speaking of, of, a, of a pious kind of prayer, but the, rea the cry of the heart should be, don't let me spoil, don't let me hinder, don't let me destroy. Uh, we could put it in the context of filming. This episode, God, this episode of my uh, whatever it is in your in your uh, thing for me to do. How is it that you often hear expressed the idea that if you just have enough faith, you'll be healed of whatever the problem is? And this seems to often lead to a really cruel situation of self-doubt. How's all that come about? I don't believe most people really take seriously the fall. Uh, to me, it's ground into me, all the way down to the depths of my being. We live in a fallen world, it's abnormal. It's not going to be normal, as Mother said, till Jesus comes back again. Now then, I am not surprised, therefore, when it is not, uh, not normal. I'm not surprised when trouble comes. Uh, I take seriously the fact that when the revolt came against God, that everything under the dominion of a man with a capital M was spoiled. This is a spoiled universe. I see it that way. The danger, of course, is seeing it all spoiled and losing the creation beauty, losing the, the, gore, the glory of life. Life's marvelous. Uh, the human relationships, just Edith and myself, um, that's precious beyond words. There's no way to evaluate the, the wonder of our relationship through all these years, from the time she was 17 and I was 20 until now. So there's plenty of beauty there and there's wonder there. But at the same time, the world is out of joint. Now, if this is not only a theological proposition to be fought for in, uh, in insisting on the uh, reality, on the historicity of the first three chapters of Genesis or 11 or something, if, if it isn't up there but it's down into life, it gives you a framework to see things which are very real, which I think is the biblical framework. Now, you do have to say this, that I think there are three sources of, uh, for trouble uh, in a Christian's life. The first one is uh, shown most of all in Job, and that's the battle that Mother talked about in the heavenlies. Um, we, we, our life is too, too circumvented. The way we, we, we live in the world's way of living, uh, of looking at life if we're not careful. But in the biblical way of looking at life, there's a vertical and a horizontal extension which removes us out of the merely moment-by-moment -moment human. And the one, the vertical one, is that we're sharing in the battle of the heavenlies now in a way that we don't understand. And Job is the big example. People often forget something about Job. When we read the book of Job, we have the first couple chapters, so we know that it was a part of the battle in the heavenlies. Poor Job didn't know that. The heaven just fell in on him. His children were killed. His cattle carried off. He didn't know what he was a part of the battle of the heavenlies. We don't either. The horizontal extension, of course, so is... So that's one area that, that we have to take into account. The, of the battle, uh, okay. of troubles. Okay, and the second The area. second area is that Hebrew says that sometime God does chasten us, and that indeed, uh, indeed, uh, we have to consider when trouble comes with seriousness, Father, you're teaching me something. And um, sometimes we can see very clearly and say, I have to say I'm sorry. But... Uh, but that's very different from making this a universal. Mm -hmm. And in addition, you would say that's very different than going to someone else and saying, now, fella, you're suffering. What's God trying to teach you? No, no, uh, nobody ever ought to say that to anybody. Can you think of anything more cruel than that? Nothing. I had an example. I learned it with tremendous ferocity. In my first pastor in Grove City, uh, there was a, a dear woman there uh, uh, with multiple sclerosis. I remember her name. I loved her very deeply. And I loved her husband. They're both dead now, but they're both very um, fragrant in my memory. Uh, and she had multiple sclerosis, and she was getting worse and worse and worse. 
and she was dear. And I would say a lot of the uh, results there in the Grove City Church came from the fact that in her I had a real prayer partner, with mother too, of course. So this woman, Mrs. Armour, and her husband, Mr. Armour, both of whom are dead now, really are very fragment in my thinking after all these years. And uh, I think a lot of the blessing in Grove City came in the fact, not only of my mother's and my prayer times together, but I could go to this woman and talk to her about the troubles in the congregation. And I knew she wouldn't talk. And she shared with me in prayer, uh, almost step by step, just as mother and I always shared everything. Now, one day, uh, if I've ever seen anybody love the Lord, that woman loved the Lord. And one day I came and she was in tears. And some people who believe this other way had gotten into her and told her she must have the sickness because there must have been sin in her life. And I was furious. I remember Mr. Armour stormed and he said, if I could get my hands on those people. Because this woman, here she had this trouble. Now they heaped this feeling of guilt on her until her husband and I were to, ready to could dispel it. I can't, I've never... Now, let me say this firmly. I've never in all my life seen anything more cruel. Were you angry? I was furious. I was furious. I, really. I'm furious now just telling you about it. My blood pressure's going up. And this was terrible. And it, it is cruel. And it roots back uh, into, into this mistaken idea of the fact that we escape the fallen world just because we're Christian, if we're Christian, and if we have enough faith. And that just isn't true. One thing I've learned throughout uh, my ministry, and all the way up to when I have found I had cancer in the Mayo Clinic, and then one of the doctors, for example, a fellow by the name of Steve, a very dear Christian, um, asked, said, would you please visit my mother? She's just found today she had cancer. She's read your book. She respects you. She's really very, very down. Would you please visit her? So, of course, I immediately got up and went over to the hospital and visited her. And I remember her first question. It was, oh, I, well, after she said how glad she was to see me, et cetera, et cetera. Then she said, why has God done this to me? And that demands an answer. And the answer is God hasn't done to you. And I talked to her about the battle in the heavenlies and Hebrews. But then I came back to what uh, I thought was a real explanation. We live in a, a cause and effect universe. And the cause and effect is out of joint because of the rebellion. The whole thing's out of joint. So therefore, uh, after talking to her about this, uh, I must say, when I left, she was an entirely different person. Well, there seem to be a lot of Christians wandering around who feel like second-class citizens and feel guilty and inferior for one reason or another, mainly because they haven't achieved what they regard as perfection or healing or whatever in uh, some area of their lives. How has this come about? I would say it's a misunderstanding, and that is uh, that the Bible does not promise us perfection in any area until uh, the restoration of all things when Christ comes back. Uh, you see, you, you, people read the Bible too simply. In a way, you can't read it too simply, but you're going, it's too simply now as I'm describing it. They'll pick out this and they leave that. So Jesus says, anything you ask in my name, I'll give you. Well, if you just take that, that, that sounds in this direction, something like this. But then you turn back uh, and you see Jesus himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus himself, and to me this is one of the great crucial moments of all, all history, of everything. And Jesus is saying, here I am, Father, if it could be your will, take it away. But don't take it away uh, if it's going to spoil, if it's going to spoil the, uh, my, the work I came into the world to do. Now you extend that to Paul. Uh, who's going to say Paul is a man of lack of faith? Or he isn't praying. We know he prayed all the time. He says he did. Uh, and yet at the same time, he says expressly he had a thorn in the flesh, and there's no reason not to think that it was physical, none, none whatsoever. And he asked three times to be removed, and it wasn't removed. But God is not a dispensing machine. God is a personal God. And I must allow him to answer my prayers in the light of his wisdom instead of my limitedness. And that's not a cop-out? Not at all. Not all. It's rooted in the heart of all things, and that is he's infinite, I'm finite. I, I'll tell you something. 
Nothing could terrify me more, and I'm being very serious, nothing could terrify me more than that I could ask for anything today and get it, because I don't know enough. Including for your own health? Oh, absolutely. Just okay. as much as for anything. Are you willing to say that as a person who, okay, let's face it, has cancer that's serious enough so it could be killing you? Yeah, of course. And you could push a button and say, get me over my cancer, and if you had, quote, enough faith, you know it would work like a machine, uh, even at risk of yourself dying of the disease, you'd rather have it the other way? Well, I'd split it, to be honest. If I could wave a wand or push a button and get rid of it, in one sense, of course I'd do it. Who wants cancer? I mean, let's not kid ourselves. It's, it's no pleasure to live with this thing on top of my head all the time um, and going up and down, you know what I mean? Uh, but on the other hand, more profoundly, I think I can honestly say sitting here that I, I would rather trust God's wisdom than mine. What, is your, what has been your personal prayer in terms of your cancer? What have you told God when they, when they told you that you might have a few months to live? Well, I prayed that if the Lord, uh, if the Lord would, if it was uh, what would indeed be best in his, uh, his sight, that he would cure me. Now, let me say, I believe God can cure in answer to prayer. We've seen it in La Brie a fair number of times. Okay. So I want to stress that. Though. But what was your personal yeah, prayer? Yeah, but now let me stress it. It isn't that he can't. But that my prayer was, Lord, here I am, and I know you can, and yet here I am, and if it is your will, and that, I don't mean that as a, as a religious cop-out. I mean, all I've said, you're infinite God, yeah. I'm finite, mm -hmm. uh, etc. I don't know the results of things. Uh, in the light of this, uh, really and truly, uh, uh, I want what you know is right and best. So you've not, in fact, demanded anything? I never demand anything in prayer. As if some guy... Well, now, I'm a sinner, too, so sometimes I do, but I try not to. I like an illustration that I often use in Saturday night discussion in La Brie, and that is down on the Eagle platform where I used to catch a train all the time, there was a, a slot machine. You put in 20 centimes, it's the old days, before inflation, you got out a certain kind of caramel. Uh, you could always do this, but now that's a mechanical relationship. We must remember that our relationship to God is never mechanical. It's always personal. And he, I must come to God dealing with him as a person and realizing that he knows more than I know. And what I must wish is for him to deal with me in my prayer. And we have a promise. And that is in Romans 8 that the Holy Spirit will take our prayer and to make it into what it ought to be. And I think that's what it's talking about.